Hi, I'm Rob Packard from Medical Device Academy's channel on YouTube. A giant size thank you out to each of our channel subscribers. Please keep sending your questions and ideas for a new video topic. You're the reason our channel keeps growing. If you're new to our community, please click on the red subscribe button and, no and the notification bell. This will ensure that you never miss out on the latest updates for medical device regulations and quality system requirements. Today's video is gonna be about 10, 15 minutes long and I'm going to be answering a question I get a lot from companies that are developing software as a medical device. Software as a medical device is software that doesn't have any hardware associated with it. So it doesn't have a sensor, it doesn't have an electrode, it isn't embedded in the system. It's either in the cloud, it's on a mobile app, or um, it's provided in some way that doesn't require any electrical hardware that you ha have to worry about for the design of your medical device. And for those companies that just have to worry about software, they ask me, what is the minimum requirement that we need for our quality system and our documentation for the FDA? Because oftentimes they're familiar with software development, but they're not familiar with what the FDA's requirements are. And one of the questions we get down to is, should you combine your software development lifecycle procedure, which is compliant with IEC 62304, with your design consult control procedure, which is compliant with ISO 1345 and the FDA QSR. And a lot of these companies aren't even familiar with what IEC 62304 is. So if you're wondering what 62304 is, I'll provide a link below in the uh, comments for this video. And if you're looking at this on our, um, on our uh, blog page where we just posted an article about this, follow one of the hyperlinks for IEC 62304. So the first thing you should be aware of if you're one of these companies that's developing software as a medical device is the FDA has already published a bunch of free guidance documents out there on what the documentation is required for a 510k submission to the FDA. And the 510k is just the most common pathway for about 80% of medical devices to get uh, uh, on the market in the US. And the five free guidance documents the FDA has published, I've provided hyperlinks, and I'm gonna put those below in the comments for this video. And if you're reading this on our blog page, you'll find the five hyperlinks below. The first one is General Principles of Software Validation. That's a 2002 guidance document. And a lot of the content in that one is also copied again in the second guidance document, which is a 2005 guidance document. And it's the content of pre-market submissions for software containing medical devices. So whether you have a device that has hardware and software, or you have software as a medical device, this is what the FDA wants to see when you submit a pre-market notification or 510K submission to the FDA. The third guidance document is content of pre-market submissions for management of cybersecurity and medical devices. That's a 2014 guidance document. And the reason why the FDA created that is they really didn't feel the IEC 62304 guidance document or standard provided enough detail for what should be included for cybersecurity. So the FDA, the US FDA has just gone overboard and what they expect for cybersecurity back in 2014. And now the rest of the world is catching up with that need. So the FDA was really leading things on what should be done for cybersecurity of software that is embedded in medical devices and software as a medical device for standalone devices that are software. The fourth guidance document is the post-market uh, post -market management of cybersecurity of medical devices. That's a 2016 guidance document. And that guidance document is what things the FDA expects you to have in a plan for your device after you release it on the market. So after they've approved it, after they've released it, you need to monitor cybersecurity of your software operating system, any off-the-shelf software that you've used, and in general, what you learn about uh, different uh, cybersecurity threats and attacks uh, that, that hackers are trying to use um, and how they could affect your medical device and prevent it from operating correctly or cause harm to a person. And the last guidance document is about off-the-shelf software because unlike when I went to school and learned how to do programming where everything was uh, machine languages or very simple basic languages, uh, Fortran, now we have rapid pr uh, programming languages where you copy and paste in code from other developers and embed it into your software. And that's the common way that people develop software 
but even though it's faster, it has the trade-off of it. You can also bring over uh, um, unintended um, uh, cybersecurity um, threats or uh, access points for hackers that are trying to access your software. So whether you brought over a software library or you're using an operating system such as uh, a Chrome browser, uh, whatever you, or maybe it's a, a Microsoft uh, Windows operating system on your embedded system, whatever it is, you bring over along with that code all the potential risks that are associated from a cybersecurity standpoint. So that guidance document is a 2019 guidance document. And these five guidance documents are the five free guidance documents that you can download from the FDA website um, if you just follow those hyperlinks. And that will help you develop your documentation for um, submitting a 510K to the FDA. In the next slide, I show the 13, uh, 13 documents that the FDA expects you to include in a submission of a 510K if you have a moderate level of concern. And the first document is a level of concern document. So you have to determine, is your device a minor level of concern, a moderate level of concern, or a major level of concern? And that depends on how you answer certain questions the FDA poses. So if you look at the guidance documents that I provided in the previous slide, you'll learn how to answer those questions. And if you're using the new eStar template, it actually asks you those questions, then the answers are embedded right into the template. So you can't submit without answering those questions. Once you've determined whether it's a minor level of concern or a major level of concern, then that'll determine which of these documents you're required uh, to include. If it's a moderate level of concern, it's gonna be all of these. If it's major, you're gonna have all of these plus some additional detail uh, rather than summaries for some of these. And if it's minor, there are gonna be a few things that you don't have to provide, such as an architecture design chart, uh, software design specification, or a software development environment description. Now, if you're going to combine this, the, the requirements for software documentation, which is in IEC 62304, and like I said, we'll provide the link below, if you're gonna combine that with design controls, which is in the 21 CFR 820 quality system regulation from the FDA and also in ISO 1345 2016, if you're gonna combine those two into one procedure, these are the how the, the, um, the two documents sort of mesh up and where the different documents fit in different parts of the design process. So the first phase of design is planning. And the three documents that you should be preparing during the planning phase are the level of concern document, the software description, and the software development environment description. And that last one is basically your procedure for how you're gonna accomplish software development, document it, and accomplish design controls if you're gonna combine these two together. The second phase is design inputs. This is where you do a hazard analysis. So a lot of people think of risk analysis as something they're doing only during the development phase or only later on as documentation. But in fact, risk controls and risk management is done throughout the entire development process. And during the design inputs phase, you wanna identify what hazards exist for your software. And one of the ways to do that is to look at the ISO 14971 guidance and answer a bunch of questions. That's, um, that guidance is ISO 24971 2020. And Annex A is where you'll find those 37 questions that prompt you to identify hazards in a brainstorming session. Another way to do that is to systematically go through the ISO 14971 guidance Annex C and look at the different categories of hazards. And the third way, and this is really important, is to look at previous versions of your product or look at similar products that are on the market and identify the hazards associated with that software. And you might look at adverse event reporting for that information. Once you've identified the hazards, now you can use that to help you identify software requirement specification or um, basically your design inputs for your uh, software. And then you can create an architecture design chart for your software. So those three things comprise the software design inputs for your project. Once you've developed the inputs and you approve those, and that's a key point, the FDA requires approval of the design inputs, then you go on to the development phase. And this is usually the longest phase of, of your design process. It's iterative. So those of you that are used to um, uh, using agile development of software, and you're used to having sprints, 
This is the iterative phase. That's the, the key portion of your development. It's the longest part. And every single time you try to develop a unit uh, module for your software and you go to run or compile that unit, you may have an error. And if you have an error, you're gonna go back and change some code and run it again. Well, that iterative process, that gets documented and you wanna document every single time you go through that process. Um, but before you even get to that iterative development, and you document all your verification validation information, you're gonna to need to identify design specifications for your software. You're gonna to have to identify a revision level and update the revision every time you make a change. You're gonna to have to go through the cybersecurity documentation and those guidance documents to document what kind of risk controls you're gonna put in place to prevent cybersecurity threats. And any off the shelf libraries or operating systems you use, you need to document the risk analysis for that. So this is where you're not only documenting the design specs for your software, but you're also gonna be documenting your risk analysis and doing risk evaluation of your software. And each time you compile the software and go to verify and validate that it works properly, either as a unit test or an integration test, um, that's when you're going to if you fail, go back to your design outputs and update that. And you can keep on doing that over and over again. And they say, don't, don't do that. You should have a, a waterfall process and you should have a firm design freeze and you should never go on to verification validation unless your design outputs are done. But in the world of software, it doesn't cost you very much to have an iterative process and go back and revalidate. Whereas if you have other types of product like hardware, it gets expensive to revalidate. So that old rule of have a design freeze, don't change your outputs because then you'll have to go back and revalidate doesn't apply software because it's so cheap to keep on uh, iteratively um, changing your outputs. So that's one of the unique things to software in your procedure, you're gonna to wanna to say it's okay for us to go back and change the design outputs or even change design inputs and start the whole process over again because it doesn't take very long and it doesn't cost very much money. So you'll update these software design specs, you'll update the revision history, you'll update your cybersecurity documentation and update your OTS software risk analysis as you add in more modules and make your software more complex and add all the features that your customers ultimately need. Once you've gotten to the final version of the process, you're gonna take all that documentation from every unit test you did and every single one you passed and failed, every single integration test that you passed and failed and summarize that in your verification validation documentation. And there's still probably going to be a few unresolved anomalies and that's usually okay for software if it gives you an error message or it won't compile. If, if it compiles and gives you a wrong answer and it's a diagnostic software, that's bad. And that would be an unresolved anomaly that wouldn't be acceptable to release. But if it's something that gives you an error message, it's often okay to release the software that way. And the FDA wants to know what those are. They also want a traceability analysis that takes you all the way back to your design inputs. So your design device hazard analysis, your SRS and your architecture design chart and walks you through the design outputs, your software design specification and your risk analysis and then finally it takes you to, here's our verification and validation reports for unit tests, integration tests, and the final system validation. So that's what you're expected to compile, all this documentation. And now that you've gone through the four phases of design and development for a software as a medical device, now you have everything you need to compile into a 510K. And that's all gonna go into section 16 of your submission to the FDA. And then the FDA is gonna start the review. That review is gonna take probably about 90 to 120 days. And the FDA may ask some questions. That's why it could take longer than 90 days. And once they've finally said, okay, we clear your device, now you can release the product and you reach the final phase of design and development, which is where you release your product on the market. Now, when this happens, you're gonna to have to add a UDI or unique device identifier to your software on the about page. You might've just had a, a placeholder on your software at the time of releasing the software uh, or at the time you submitted the software to the FDA. But now that it's released, now you may get this actual UDI code for, um, for official assigning to your software. 
and you'll probably want to update your revision history to show that this is the version that has the real UDI code in there. You're going to want to upload all that information to the FDA's good um, uh, GUDID database. You're going to indicate any unresolved anomalies that you might have uh, resolved in the last 90 to 120 days while the FDA was reviewing. You might have more, you might have less. Uh, it depends on what changes you had to make to get it through the FDA um, final review. You're going to uh, document your cybersecurity um, um, with a final version of the product, and you're going to start implementing that post market surveillance management of cybersecurity now that your product's going to go on the market. You're, you also have to deal with revisions to your software because you're going to have software libraries are updated, operating systems are going to be updated, and whenever that happens, you're going to have to revise your software to make it compliant to the original version now that whatever operating system it had to work under or software libraries have been updated as well. But every time you make an update to the software, you have to decide whether that requires you to resubmit a 510K for the software change uh, to an existing device. And I provide a hyperlink down below for that guidance document. So that's a sixth guidance document that's free from the FDA on when to submit your 510K for a software change. I hope you enjoyed this um, presentation. I hope it was helpful for those software companies that are uh, developing their first medical device and wanted to know whether they can combine their procedure for managing software uh, uh, software documentation as well as design controls and put it all into one document. Um, if you are going to uh, develop your quality system right now, one of the things that you should do if you're watching this video is re click on the link to our blog and read the rest of the blog about this and follow some of the hyperlinks. Um, in there is going to be a link to a standard called IEC 62304 and a place to buy it cheaper than you can normally buy it. So those of you that have listened to the end, you're winning out here. You're going to be able to click on that link and you're going to be able to buy your software um, guidance document or standard cheaper than everybody else. Um, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to put them in the comment, comments below or suggest an idea for a future video on software documentation. Thank you for watching the video. Please remember to like this video and share it with other people in your company or med tech industry that you think would benefit the from this training video. And if you have a question or suggestion for a future video, please share it in the comments below. Thank you.